Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Augustana Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Kirk, and uh, assisting alongside me today is our uh, honorary assistant deacon, Alexa Wallace. On behalf of Pat, where are you? There you are. Wow. <laughs> Front row. Um, be, on, on, on Pat's behalf and uh, on behalf of the family, I would like to just welcome you uh, and thank you for being here uh, as we gather to honor Barry's life and his memory. Uh, whether you manage to cram yourself into a seat somewhere uh, or whether you are um, watching um, online uh, through live stream somewhere else um, at the, today, uh, we're glad that you are able to be here. We know that uh, Barry and Pat have lots of connections in the university and in the sports community, uh, as well as here in the church community as well. And so thank you for the ways that you have shown your friendship to the Blakely Flam family over the years, but especially in these last a few weeks. For those of you who have not been to a funeral here before, we use something called a liturgy. Uh, it means the work of the people. It's a guide uh, to important um, moments like this where we are often at a loss for words. And so we lean into the wisdom of those who have gone on before us to join our voices to those who have uh, given witness to the God who reminds us that death is not the end. And so as we uh, enter into this time, uh, you're invited uh, to turn to in your red hymnals that are before you to page 279, 279 and participate in all of the words that are spoken, uh, responding in the bold print. As well, feel free to sing along with the hymns. They'll either be in that uh, red book or sometimes in the purple book in front of you. Um, feel free to sing along, even if they are maybe perhaps a bit unfamiliar to you, uh, as, long, as well as pray alongside us as you feel comfortable or if you just want to be present in this space and in a way that's inauthentic to you, you're invited to do that and we thank you for that presence today. As we gather, we are mindful and we gratefully acknowledge that we do so here on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis people. And so welcome in the name of Jesus, who draws us into the deep love of God. We are gathered here to do many things, to remember before God, Barry Blakely, to give thanks for his life, to proclaim Christ crucified and risen, and to commend him to our merciful Redeemer, and to comfort one another in our grief. And so we begin our journey today with God as we did in the beginning in the waters of our baptisms. It's here that Barry was named and claimed a child of God, dearly loved by the God who has never been far off. And so we gather to remember this even as we mourn the loss of his life. And we give thanks for, the, for God's promises that all who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And so in his baptism, Barry was clothed with Christ. And in the day of Christ's coming, he will be clothed in glory. And so we give thanks. Eternal God, maker of heaven and earth, who formed us in the dust of the earth, and who by your breath gave us life, we glorify you. We glorify you. Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life, who suffered death for all humanity, who rose from the grave to open the way to eternal life, we praise, we praise you. Holy Spirit, author and giver of life, the comforter of all who sorrow, our sure confidence and our everlasting hope, we worship you. 
For to you, O blessed Trinity, be glory and honor now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, source of all mercy and giver of comfort, graciously tend those who mourn, that, casting all their sorrow on you, they may know the consolation of your love through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. For our choir anthem today, the choir will sing the first two verses, and then I invite you all to join on page 10,020 of the Purple Book, 1020, for the last two verses. At this point, I invite Brian, Jillian, and Ken to come forward, each in turn, and share a few memories they prepared for Barry. Hello, I'm uh, Brian Blakely, uh, Barry's younger brother. <laughs> I think I've known Barry longer than any other living person, so I have sort of a, uh, a different perspective. <laughs> and I'll discuss um, him as a person and a big brother. I think others will discuss his uh, academic and sports achievements, so I won't dwell on those. I'll use some examples and insight from our life together, I guess. <laughs> he was a great big brother and a, and a, a good teacher. 
Uh, and I learned a lot from him, sometimes by direct uh, teaching and sometimes by example, which is actually a very good way to teach. He was always on my side and stuck up for me when we were young, protected me and, and taught me a lot of things. For example, when we were very young, he uh, taught me how to build wooden soapbox derby cars. He decided one day he would uh, like to enter the soapbox derby. And he thought things through very well, as he, as he always does, and realized that the key to winning was in the wheels. So he went out and bought four brand new, high quality, ball bearing, 12 inch wheels, which is the maximum size you're allowed. And then he built a really good wooden soapbox derby, which lasted and lasted. I tried to build a, build a few according to his instructions, and they were okay, but they kind of fell apart. But a few years later, uh, after he won the soapbox derby with his, with his car, I borrowed it from him and, and won it again. Um, <clears throat> then, a few years after that, I became a recreation supervisor and was supervising the, the uh, soapbox derby. And what should come along but a car with 12 really nice wheels called Checkmate, which is what his car was. And that won the, the prize again. So his car lasted for years and years. And uh, I think General Motors could have a, a thing or few two to learn from him about making cars. But we did a lot of things together. We camped out in our backyard and in a tent and uh, did all sorts of things, hunted uh, field mice in the outskirts of the city. At that time, that was at uh, Walter Murray Collegiate. And uh, later I went to that school and when I didn't know what to do, I would just follow the example of my big brother and it worked out very well because he just sort of always knew what to do. He was uh, very rational, reliable, very thoughtful and, and highly competent. But he had a, a playful side too. He was very good at picking out nicknames for his siblings. Uh, I tried to do the same, but mine, mine never stuck, but his took and became uh, sort of permanent. And if you think I'm going to tell you what they are, you can think again. Uh, he also taught me not to believe everything we're told. Uh, for, for example, uh, on Saturday afternoons when we were young, the Broadway Theater down the street used to have Saturday matinees for, for kids for 15 cents. So we'd go there and watch uh, Old Yeller and Spartacus and uh, movies like that. Well, Barry showed me what you do with your popcorn box after it's empty. You can flatten it out, and then you can throw it like a Frisbee. And he told me that, you know, if you hit the screen at the front of the theater, you got a prize. <laughs> well, I never was able to earn that prize, although I suspect if I did so, there would have been some interaction with the staff. Um, <clears throat> we used to shoot arrows in the back, uh, back park behind our house when we were young, which is... Uh, actually quite dangerous for kids and we are a little bit foolish but uh, we'd shoot them up in the air and um, I was concerned about whether I'd get hit when they came down but, but Barry told me no that was impossible if you shoot the arrow straight up in the air it, it cannot hit you because it has to go up and then turn the length of that arrow and then come down so I was very confident in watching these arrows come down whoop, and I'm amazed I, I survived childhood some days <laughs> but anyways um, uh, and then there were pigeons. For, uh, Barry always had a soft spot for animals. And for a while, he raised uh, pigeons in a, and kept them in a little coop in a, behind our house. So I asked him one day, how, did you, how do you get those pigeons? That looks like fun to raise these things. And he said, well, you just go to the train bridge, and that's where all the pigeons are, and you go grab some and bring them home. <laughs> so that, I thought, well, that makes sense. So I got on my bike, and I went down there, and I climbed up on those rafters and the, the girders, you know, underneath the train bridge by the university there. And uh, really it was quite dangerous and stupid. I got over the water of the river and then realized, you know, if I did come across a pigeon that was dumb enough to let me grab him, how could I climb back with only one arm? So I went home and never did raise pigeons like he did. <laughs> a few of us, I think, become as accomplished in as many things as he was and I think others will talk about his academic and sports achievements more, but one thing you may not be aware of is that he was a really good football punter. One day he decided to learn that skill and he went out and bought a real good quality leather football and in our back park uh, learned to, to, to punt that thing and he could punt it a mile. He was better uh, than anyone I've ever seen, including the people in the CFL. 
he, he tried to, to teach me, and I was sort of okay. I was good enough to be the punter in high school and the uh, uh, kicker for the Huskies later, but I was never as good at it as he was. Um, he, uh, when, he, when he first started learning to, to pitch uh, fastball, I would try to catch for him. And that was a challenge because that ball came fast and hard, and it hurt. And I didn't have the uh, catcher's mitt. And it, and it curved and did all sorts of crazy things, and so I didn't do that awfully long. My sister, Diane, who was not able to be with us here today, had the same experience. She would try and catch some of those balls, and, uh, and it hurt. Um, <clears throat> Um, my sister Leslie, who was a little younger at that time, well, she's still younger, I guess, but uh, she was younger than she was. She, uh, she had a better idea. She would go and stand behind the backstop, and he would fire the ball, and then she'd come out and throw it back to him. <laughs> but, but they had uh, other, other memories as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, Leslie recalls she went to watch one of, his, one of his games once, and he was pitching, and um, he wanted a new ball, and uh, the umpire, for some reason, refused. And so, well, for some reason, the, the next pitch went way over the backstop and way out into the bushes, and as far as we know, was never found. <laughs> and the next ball, and the next pitch, even though it looked pretty good to a lot of people, was called a ball. <laughs> um, D Diane reminds me uh, that um, when he was young, one, one summer he worked for a roofing company and made some money. And one of the things he did is bought a, a color TV, uh, which was very new at that time. Color TVs weren't very good, but he put it in his bedroom and we watched things like Bonanza and so forth. Uh, he had the ability to, um, uh, when he ran out of Mountain Dew, he would sprint to the confectionery, which is about three blocks away, and sprint back, replenishing his supply before the commercials ended. <laughs> so he, he was good. But he had a lot of, uh, perseverance and pragmatism. He, he planned things out thoroughly and, and was a real thinker. He had the ability to see through a plan and see the flaws in it uh, quite easily, which was uh, very appreciated in, in, in a lot of uh, ways. He was very dedicated to things like the vet college and the university, and I, I admired him for that. Uh, you know, there, there are a lot of people today who, who complain and uh, don't really contribute much themselves, but Barry was very different. He, he got up, up every day and contributed, and, and he, he made a real difference. And really, we, we need more people like him, I think. He made a lot of important contributions, as uh, other people will mention as well. I was able to be with him on his last uh, day of life, and he really didn't have much in the way of pain. It was quite lucid. We, we had a very nice conversation about the years gone by and visiting our grandparents and so forth. And um, uh, it, was, it was very nice. I, I, I know that sometimes when people die, they have things they want to get off their chest and, and uh, regrets and so forth. And so I asked him, you know, do you, do you have anything you want to say or express? And uh, he knew exactly what it meant. And he looked and thought about it for a moment. He said, you know, I don't think I have anything to say. And while driving back to Winnipeg after that, I, I thought to myself, you know, that's kind of the way to go, to, to, to leave and have no regrets and to know that you made a difference. And maybe that's all we can do, you know, to make, sure, make our life worth something, to, to make a difference, and try, this, try to make this world a little better than the way we found it. So we're all going to die someday, but I think in that final day I, I learned one more thing from him, and that that's, that's the way we should go. So I'd like to say goodbye to Barry, and I'll see you on the other side. So I'm Julie Muir. I'm now currently the Dean at the Western College of Veterinary Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan, where Barry has worked for the past 44 years. And so I've known Barry since the 80s, not as long as his brother, obviously, uh, when I was a vet student in his veterinary toxicology course, and he was then a young <coughs> faculty member in the college. He joined the faculty in 1980 
after getting his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from the college and then his PhD in the, in the United States. So I joined his department as, faculty member, as a faculty member in the 90s and Barry and I have been colleagues since then. Um, and eventually he became my boss for a while and then I was his boss for a while as these things go in academia. And of course, like many of us, I've been thinking about Barry a lot over the last weeks. And um, one of the things that kept coming up for me was that I remember him as a man who, who, who loved what he did. He loved his work. He loved everything he did, and that was evident every day. He was interested in the cases that he worked on. He, was, he loved teaching and talking about those cases. He was interested in the people that he worked with, the students and the staff and the faculty. He loved being at work. And I remember very early in my career, he actually took a sabbatical leave. And then he told me when he got back that he would not recommend sabbaticals to anyone. <laughs> he didn't know why anybody took them. Um, and it, I think it's because he loved what he did. He couldn't figure out why anybody would want to take a leave from it. He loved his work. And I don't remember him taking a leave again, honestly. I think for the rest of the 44 years he was here. So, and he was always very eager to share his love for his work. He loved to talk about what he was doing. He loved to talk with people about what was going on at the college. And a typical Barry conversation was, I think, of my last conversation that I had with him in person. Just over a month ago, he came up to my office and we started, he wanted to talk about the latest toxicology case that he was working on, he was thinking about, and then it moved into a conversation about um, a talkie dad, something, something he'd been talking about with folks in the department. And then he gave me some advice on something that he thought I should do. And um, he often gave me advice, and admittedly, I didn't always take it. Uh, we didn't always agree, but, but I paid attention, close attention every time because there was inevitably a strong thread of wisdom through all of his advice, born of his long experience at the university and in the college with people and with situations. And he had an incredibly long memory he could remember, remember things that happened ages ago. And we often wondered um, in the college amongst ourselves how Barry could spend so much time talking to people and still get so much done. <laughs> it's still a mystery. We haven't figured it out. But he did accomplish a lot. He, he's the, the usual academic stuff, well over 100, 100 academic scientific papers, numerous book chapters. He taught many, many lecture, many hours of lecture in numerous toxicology courses, so many undergraduate students in the DVM program and in the toxicology program benefited from his long experience. Um, and he was still teaching, still teaching until he got too sick to do it. He stepped up to serve as department head. He was the graduate chair in the toxicology program for many, many years. And he's been just instrumental in the growth and success of that program at the university. And on top of all of this, and remarkable and quite unusual for an academic is the enormous volume of work that he accomplished as a diagnostician for toxicological and nutritional cases across Western Canada, cases that have come through the lab, cases that he, he's talked to veterinarians and producers with over the phone. He's had an, just an enormous impact on the health of animals across the country. He's in, and he interpreted thousands, literally thousands of cases every single year talked on the phone hundreds of times. He'd come to say, another 700 phone calls this year, he'd say to me, like seriously, 700 phone calls with veterinarians, with producers, other labs. Sometimes these ended up in legal cases in which he was the expert witness. Um, sometimes the, the work ended up changing guidelines on, on safety levels for tox toxins. And then, so, and all of this work combined with his incredible memory for cases and situations contributed to his absolutely renowned expertise in animal toxicology, both nationally and internationally. But I think, in many ways, the biggest impact he's had is on the people that have had the fortune to, to, to interact with him. So since in the last couple of weeks, I've had messages from veterinarians across Western Canada speaking about his generosity, how, they spent time, how he spent time with them, phone call after phone call, helping them to get to a diagnosis. 
And they talked about how they knew how much he cared about them, how much he cared about their cases, how much he cared about their, their clients and their patients. And, and I've just heard today that the Saskatchewan Vet Men Association have just honored him by naming him to na naming their leadership and mentorship award after him. That's how much impact he's had on the community. I've also had outpouring of messages from people across the college who tell me also how generous he was with his time, how he genuinely cared about them. He asked about how they were, their work, and how much they're going to miss him miss him and all the connections that he made between all of us at the college. And for me, um, I'm going to miss a lot about Barry. I'm going to miss that, that characteristic sort of run walk he used to do, <laughs> right? Remember that? It was sort of asymmetric and there was a shoulder up and he was always running past my office to get to his phone, which was ringing. <laughs> Or he was running from the vet school over to the talk center in that crazy way, right? Because <laughs> he was late for a meeting or he was late for a class. I am going to miss him suddenly appearing in my doorway, telling me about the latest case he had or something he thought I should be doing. Um, I'm going to miss it, his advice. I'm going to miss his friendship. But most of all, I'm just going to miss having somebody around who loved what he did so much who set an example of generosity and caring and connection that made the college a better place for all of us to work, a better place for all of us to be, for those of us who had the good fortune to know and to work with him. So I just want to say thank you, Barry. You're much loved, and you will be so missed. Of two exceptional speakers like that. I'll do my best. Barry Blakely, son, brother, husband, father, grandfather, friend. It's an honor and privilege to participate in today's celebration of Barry's life in the presence of loved ones, family, and friends. Thank you, Pat, for the privilege. I will be forever grateful. And even though she told me not to exceed five minutes, <coughs> I wish her good luck. <laughs> even though the outcome was inevitable, when Pat phoned me, we were down in the States, to tell me that Barry had passed, it was like a literal kick in the gut, literally. I literally had to sit down. And then I lay down and I have not been myself since. I met Blake through an informally organized fastball league in the summer of 1971. He probably organized the league. I was enrolled in pre-dentistry at the time, hoping to earn admission into the College of Dentistry. He was one of the most positive people I've ever known. Without his influence and support, I would never have played special men's fastball with the Aberdeen Knights or with the Twisters. Twisters. <laughs> we played hockey and fastball for and against each other for eons. Pitching. He was good at verbal pitching, but he was also good at pitching fastballs. <laughs> he was an elite level, elite level pitcher with a changeup that fooled even the best of hitters succeeding with deception and intelligence rather than velocity. And his riser was often unhittable, starting well below his knees before rising and crossing the plate above the batter's chest. He threw left-handed and rotated the brim of his cap one-eighth of a turn to the right <laughs> so that when he pitched, he didn't knock it off. We called it the lock. When he was pitching, Everyone in the dugout would put their hat on lock in support. 
with his hat on lock, his glasses on the tip of his nose, and his delivery a maze of arms and legs. It was a sight to behold. <laughs> you never knew where the pitch was coming from. Hockey. With Wesley's and later with old guys hockey, his skating style was unique to say the least. It never had been taught by experts, but it was highly effective and deceptive. He was an exceptional defenseman with a poke check. He could poke check you from 10 feet away and then talk to you all the way to the bench. <laughs> Personal. He loved talking about his veterinary career as much as he loved living it. To be accurate, he was a conversation looking for a place to happen. <laughs> he loved talking sports about sports as much as he loved playing them. It's a little known fact that he had a PhD in talking. I usually had to say goodbye multiple times to end our phone conversations, and I'm, su I'm sure you've all have had that experience. I'm sure you've all had that experience. I was going to say rotten, how are you doing? But that's his nickname, I shouldn't use that. Anyway, I usually had to say multiple, goodbye multiple times to end our phone conversations. Sound familiar to any of you? Sometimes after repeated unsuccessful attempts, I would just say goodbye again and hang up. <laughs> he was never offended. Sometimes he'd call me right back for one last point. <laughs> and sometimes I had to hang up again. <laughs> Barry became a consummate academic, expert in sub five subfields of veterinary medicine, respected and acknowledged worldwide. He demanded as a speaker, consultant, reviewer, and confidant. He would get me on the phone and tell me about a trial that he was involved with and how his testimony made a difference. He was brilliant. Yet he remained humble and self-effacing. Well, almost all the time anyway. I would not be surprised if his IQ score made him a genius. He dearly loved his immediate and extended family. Pat is also a highly respected professor MD, PhD, FRCPC, and their children were all successful in their own right. Neighbors and connections. Ed and Dorothy Blakely and their three kids, Barry, Brian, Diane, Leslie, and Janet, lived across Cumberland Avenue from Claude and Joyce Stearns, and their kids, Cheryl, AKA Sherry, and David, from 1958 to 1972. <coughs> Who could have known back there that in 1984, I would meet Sherry and that we would be married in 1986. Our wedding cake mysteriously disappeared during the wedding reception. Of course, none of the twisters knew what had happened or had any idea who took it. But we all know who took it. <laughs> it rhymes with twisters. Road trips. We would go to many tournaments in rural Saskatchewan, and Barry routinely pitched twice a day, sometimes three times. He would pitch to exhaustion and beyond. Returning home from a fastball road trip, he would stop at a KFC restaurant, come out with a bucket of chicken under each arm. And the guys in the car knew they were both for him. <laughs> and he bought, their own, he bought their own bucket to eat. Barry ate every piece of his own chicken, and every, leftover, every piece left over by the others. His appetite for food was equaled only by his appetite for sports and life. Golden twisters. Golden means old. When some of us were reluctantly, uh, some of us reluctantly admitted or were told in no uncertain terms that we were no longer capable of playing at the special men's level, we joined the golden twisters in division two. At that level, it was not unusual for Barry to walk the first three batters in the first inning on 12 consecutive pitches. Then, he would strike out the next three batters on nine consecutive pitches. He had difficulty intentionally walking a batter on four pitches without throwing one down the middle and giving up a hit. Ever practical and innovative, instead of pitching the ball, he would roll the ball along the ground four times and put him on first base. That confirms his genius IQ. 
character. To this point in my life, no one I have ever known phoned their friends to matter-of-factly advise them of his own terminal illness. Without embellishment, self-pity, or sympathy, seeking sympathy. As difficult as this must have been for Barry, it typifies his logic and courage. We had two more conversations after that. Pre-notification provided the chance to say farewell in person before the funeral, an opportunity that is seldom, if ever possible. What an exceptional final gift from an equally exceptional human being. I hope to have the chance to do the same when I pass. Others may differ. He left this world as he lived it, with dignity, conviction, and consideration. I'd like to quote from Rudyard, Rudyard Kipling's poem, If. If you can keep your head up when all about you are losing theirs and blaming it on you, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you and make allowance for their doubting too, if you can wait and not be tired of waiting or being lied about, not deal in lies, or being hated, don't give way to hating, and yet don't look too good nor talk too wise. If you can dream and not make dreams your master, if you can think and not make thoughts your aim, if you can meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same, if you can force your heart and nerve and sinew to serve your turn long after they are gone and hold on when there is nothing in you except the will which says, hold on. If you can walk with crowds and keep your virtue or walk with kings, and not lose the common touch. If you can fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run, yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Blake, you were such a man. So well done. Your life was a shining example of someone whose purpose was, as Alfred Lord Tennyson put it, to strive to seek to find and not to yield. You remain a touchstone for me and many others. We are still processing, processing you not being here. You and I could go extended periods of time without talking to each other, but we could call any time and not miss a beat. We all miss you. May, we, may you rest in peace. And Winnie the Pooh said, we are fortunate to have loved someone so much that it hurts this much to lose them. You all live on, you live on in all of us, with love and ad admiration from your teammate, colleague, and friend, Suds. Fellow Twisters and, Rhett and Wesleys, please stand and, and we'll do a silent tribute for Barry. Wesleys and, Wesleys and Twisters. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot one thing. Thank you, Brian and Jillian and Ken, for those words. Um, powerful stories of, of influence of one man on, on many, and so thank you for that. I want to turn us um, to our scriptures this morning that uh, guide us in a, in, in a story of, of our lives caught up in God's life as well. And so 
what does God have to say to us in these times? And so I invite uh, Dale Kalina and, and Chris Blakely to come and read from Ecclesiastes in the Gospel of John today. Reading from Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 to 8. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, and a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. A reading from the Gospel of John, 12, verse 23 to 26. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So again, thank you to our scripture readers, to Brian and Jillian and Ken for your tributes honoring Barry today. We give thanks for the, those glimpses that your words have given us into Barry's life, things that many of us perhaps didn't know about him. Um, we are also multifaceted, right? So much so that I'm mindful of just how hard it is to capture the fullness of one's life. In just a few moments, you only had five. None of you kept to it, but that's all right. <laughs> I probably won't either. So many stories and so little time. I'm so keenly, also keenly aware of how important it is to express gratitude for how that person touched our lives something we don't do often enough uh, while they are still living. And we can see by your presence here today that Barry's was a life that was rich and diverse and that touched so many people. And so as we gather today, whether it's here in the service or later downstairs over coffee or whether you're watching from classrooms on campus or wherever you are today, I hope that you will take the time to share stories with one another about Barry, the life-affirming ones, those ones that blessed you, right down to all of the quirky ones or the downright annoying things that remind you of him, that things that made him special and unique. I even think that there's a space for all of those inappropriate stories that you haven't told yet. 
that make us either laugh or shake our heads or do both at the same time. There's room for all of it because to take any of it away would somehow feel disingenuous to whom Barry was. And I doubt Barry would have any time for that. Barry was a character. The first time I met him, I was on a visit to see Pat in their home, and Barry came home from where else? Work, right? And upon sizing me up, he let me know that he wasn't all that religious, and that he would only be in church probably one time per year, usually around Easter. You're a week early, Barry. <laughs> And I nodded at him because I'm not so easily shocked. And I offered something in return to the effect of, well, you do you, Barry. And he did, always. Though that first year I got him here three times, though. Or maybe I should say Pat got him here three <laughs> times. And yet in his last few weeks, he was gracious enough to let me come and to spend time with him uh, at home and then later in hospital. And I appreciated uh, Barry's openness with me to allow me to be a part of such important moments where we could discuss the important things like sports <laughs> and work and of course family. And in his last days, we spoke about his thoughts on life and on death and the things and the people that were important to him that he was most proud of, most who are here today, especially those who are sitting in the front pews. And faith always seemed to nip at the corner of all of these conversations, and I was reminded that even one's posture of openness rather than being closed off, is in itself an act of faith. Jesus speaks of this willingness to be open in our scriptures today as he invites us to consider how something as common as a grain of wheat holds for us a glimpse of something eternal. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, he says, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Not a stranger to the farm and being a man of science, Barry would have understood this, I think. Probably seen it before. Grains of wheat being planted in the soil, seeds that over time in the earth, as they are nourished, and watered and, and full of nutrients begin to open up as they germinate, bursting through their tough husks in order to sprout. It's not that the seed technically dies at all, but rather a poetic description of the way that we bury things in order to create more of it. <coughs> Jesus uses this metaphor here to describe his own impending death and to remind his followers of, this, of his purpose to give himself away, even to death, so that all may truly know what it means to live in this life. And so when we encounter times like this, when death seems to be the last word, we can be assured that it is not the end of our stories as our scripture reminds us, for if we are united in a death like his, surely we will be united in a resurrection like his as well. And so I invite us to embrace this image that Jesus gives us today to imagine our lives as seeds planted in the soils of our own environments hopefully in fertile places where we are nurtured and cared for, watered and tended to lovingly. 
but also to know that as in any field, there are, are always conditions that can threaten such growth, rough patches and rocky sections and the like. Barry was like all of us, uh, like all of us was in many ways, a product of our environment. He grew tall and strong and wise and a little gangly, if we're honest. <laughs> Not that that matters, he's in good company. But what is beautiful about this image is what becomes of the seed once it takes root and grows. It no longer remains a single grain, but a whole plant, which in turn bears more seeds to be planted, which also then grows more and, bear, and those plants bear their own seeds and so on and so forth until there is a great field and abundance ready for the harvest. Listening to the stories today, it seems like the great gift of Barry's life is seeing how his life has influenced so many of you. From Pat and his children and grandchildren to his colleagues and students and friends along the way, his life had an impact on all of us and has created a harvest which no one could have expected, least of all Barry, except maybe God. This one who planted the seed in the first place. God who placed him lovingly in the soil, who showered him in the waters of his baptism and claimed him as his own even before faith was possible. It was God right from the beginning. Which is why we start our service off with a thanksgiving to baptism, to remember that in life, God is there cultivating and nourishing each of us as we grow and that we might sprout and become all that we are destined to become. That we might bear an abundant harvest, not just for God's sake, but as a gift to be given away and to be received by and cherished by those around us. This giving away of oneself, of one's gifts and abilities, one's time and energy, one's character and encouragement, of one's love and friendship, was Barry's gift to all of you. His way of living out his faith, living out those baptismal promises that were spoken over him, that set him on a lifelong journey of discovery. And it is those same promises that will receive him now, even in death, as his body is returned to the ground and this cycle of life is over. He is greeted once again in the eternal arms of the great sower of the seeds and his new journey begins. And for that reason, dear friends, this is a bit of a sad day as we say goodbye, but it is also a joyful one as we gather up all of the memories and experiences that you've had with your husband, with your father, with Papa, and with your friend. May you all feel the embrace of God in these days especially as we enter into this Holy Week and Easter on the other side. May it be a reminder to you of God's great love for Barry and for you. Amen.
Friends, I invite you to stand as you're able and turn in your purple hymnals before you uh, to hymn number 1006, 1006, as we sing together, For by grace we have been saved. Moving to the red hymn books, I invite you to turn to page 282 and join me in the Apostles' Creed as we profess our faith. Page 282. Let us join together as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. Amen. Our service continues with the prayers of intercession, and I invite you to stand or be seated, whichever is more comfortable for you. Each prayer will end with the line, God of mercy, and I invite you to join in the prayers by responding, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, in holy baptism, you have knit your chosen people together into one communion of saints in the body of Christ. Give to your whole church in heaven and on earth your light and your peace. God of mercy. 
Hear our prayer. Grant that all who have been baptized into Christ's death and resurrection may die to sin and rise to share the new life in Christ. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Give courage and faith to all who mourn and assure and certain hope in your loving care that, casting all their sorrows on you, they may have strength for the days ahead. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Grant to us who are still in our journey and who walk as yet by faith that, where this world groans in grief and pain, help us to walk in the ways of justice and love for our neighbors. May your Holy Spirit lead us to bear witness to your goodness, light, and life. God of mercy, hear our prayer. Help us in the midst of things we cannot understand to believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection to life everlasting. God of mercy, hear our prayer. God, the generations rise and pass away before you. You are the strength of those who labor. You are the rest of the blessed dead. We rejoice in the company of your saints. We remember all who have lived in faith, all who have died, and especially those most dear to us who rest in you. Give us time in this life to not take things for granted, but to live out your calling and purpose for our lives each day. To your name, with the church on earth and the church in heaven, we ascribe all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue with the Lord's Prayer found on page 283 in the Red Books, page 283. As Jesus once taught his disciples to pray to God for all things as they had need, let us also pray to God in the same way, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. And so we commend Barry to the mercy of our God, to our, make, our God who is our maker and our redeemer. Into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your servant Barry. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own Redeemer. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the quote, glorious company of all the saints in light. Amen. Hymn number 631, friends. Love divine, all loves excelling. Was sung at... Pat and Barry's wedding. And so we sing it again today for the truth that it speaks.
friends, we thank you for coming today. If for those of you who uh, want to stay for a little bit, there are refreshments downstairs and get a chance to talk to the family a little bit and to Pat. Um, but appreciate your presence here with us today. Let us go forth from this place in peace. In, in the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.